Well, thank you very much for coming at bright and early on this Monday morning to our session on feature documentaries. Uh, I'm um, Rajesh Thind. I'm a filmmaker and um, long-term friend of the festival. And I've got a fantastic panel with some of the leading players in the feature doc market. Um, before I introduce them, I just, it's always just nice to get a sense of who's in the room. So could I just ask sort of any producers to put their hands up so we can... Could you put the lights up just a little bit for a second? Can I ask producers to put their hands up? Great, quite a few. Could I ask who in the room has previously made a feature documentary? And so that's... And who hasn't? Okay, majority. Great, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so to introduce the panel, we're going to... In terms of the format today, um, we've got about an hour and 15. I'm going to try and leave a lot of time for questions. And if... Uh, I'm going to leave time at the end. If there's anything you're burning to interject with during the course of the panel, do please stick your hand up and either get my attention or the attention of one of the <coughs> uh, people with roaming mics who are uh, around. Um, but we will leave at least 15 minutes and possibly sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the end. Um, we'd like to make it as interactive as possible. We're really going to try and, you know, as the blurb says, we're going to try and dig into what's happening in the feature doc market and try and get a real sense of, you know, the changes that are occurring, which are sort of wide and deep, and... Uh, routes both for experienced and more novice feature documentary filmmakers, how to think about uh, <coughs> approaching the market and adapting to the changes that are occurring. Um, I'm also going to very quickly introduce the panellists. You probably, I'm sure, know, know who they all are. And if you don't, there's this thing called Google. Um, and I'm going to ask, and this year I'm going to ask them all to do a little 60 second, just to kind of top level, you know, give you guys some info and to top load with sort of some useful bits, which I'm sure we all want. I've asked all of them to sort of prepare a 60 to 90 second state of the nation address. They're just going to sort of talk off the cuff about what the biggest issues facing them are so that we can all sort of get our notebooks out and sort of find out what's happening. So just to introduce this, Lisa Marie Rousseau, who runs the BFI Doc Society Film Fund, which is now in its beginning its second cycle. Uh, Mandy Chang, the series editor of the BBC's premier documentary stand for international documentary, feature documentary, Storyville, and Anna Vicente, who's head of international sales for Dogwoof, uh, one of the leading distribution companies in Britain and internationally. Um, and perhaps I could start with you, Mandy, mm -hmm. with your state of the nation. Okay, so, I mean, I think one of the... I mean, we all know that the landscape is just changing at a dizzying pace. There's all these new players coming in, Disney, Hulu, um, Apple... We, they haven't kind of made their big plays yet. I mean, Hulu are starting to do some really interesting things. Um, but my big plea is that I, you know, we need to keep the ecosystem healthy and there is a real danger that we will be priced out of the market because they've just got these huge sums of money and they come in and they want all the international rights and all rights in all territories in perpetuity. Um, some of them don't, like Hulu we can work with because sometimes they just take the North American rights. Um, and it, but it's having a big impact, which I'm sure Anna will talk about, on a lot of these little boutique sales agents who really look after the filmmakers and, you know, and, and, and nurture them and have relationships with them. And agents as well are coming into the business, yes. which is weird. Like when we went to Sundance, CAA, we're representing all these films. And we've been having conversations with them as well about acquisition stuff, but it's really interesting. They've got a lot of money to put into things and they're putting in money up front. So even though there's this danger, what's really heartening to me is that people are still coming to us because of the legacy of Storyville and the fact that we can make such a diversity of films and we can work with people like Lisa Marie. Um, they're still coming to us with fabulous projects. And what we have to do, I think, is, is, is jump in there and take risks. We have to take risks early. We ha it's all about relationships for us, um, and we want to have relationships with new talent, but, but also nurture people through their careers. Um, and, and I think we can be more d diverse than those big players, and we have fantastic relationships with um, other broadcasters, especially our European partners, who, who are very bold in their commissioning and um, fantastic to work with. So, so you know, I, I feel really positive um, in spite of all this. And sometimes 
change in the market forces you to, to rethink the way you work and, and, and what you do. I mean, always there's the thing, we need, we need money, we need money, we need money. But, and we do, we do, we do, you know, I would love to have a bigger pot of money to work on some really ambitious big things with, with big players because we tend to lose our big players, you know, the talent that the BBC develops. You know, Nick found Alex Gibney and people, you know, people like that who then, they're working with all the big players. But Alex still comes to us with, you know, he's still, we're still talking to him. Um, but, but that always is a struggle, I think. Um, and it's the nurture and the care and the editorial input we bring to a, to a film that I think people still come to us for. And that's a really valuable thing. And it has no price tag on it. But it's, and I've talked for way too long, so I'm yeah. going to let somebody else talk now. That's great, thank you. And uh, we'll come back to a lot of these topics and a lot of these themes, that particularly around talent and care, because a lot of the time I think filmmakers, particularly when you're making your first doc, tend to sort of <coughs> mortgage the house and sort of sell the dog and sort of, you know, and, and perhaps that's not necessarily the best way to go about it, but we'll come back to that. Mm. Anna, perhaps I could come to you next and ask you to sort of bring us a you know, distributors' perspective when you're working with all the players and sort of the changes. I know we've discussed earlier that for all of the changes and complexities, we're still very much, compared to 15 years ago, living in a great golden age of documentaries. So perhaps I could ask you to sort of yeah. jump in. No, I agree. I think 15 years ago, uh, filmmakers, producers would come here and really the only source of, to finance documentaries would be with the broadcasters. I think the broadcasters have always been there and it's been a great support, especially in the UK, and uh, docs were um, kind of financed and made for TV. There wasn't a uh, marketplace as we know it now. I mean, now we see documentaries in cinemas, we see them in, in the platforms, we see it available digitally, even there's a market for some of them on, in DVD. So it has changed a lot uh, over the last 15 years. I think it's a golden time for independent producers, filmmakers, because there is not only one way to finance documentaries, and that's good. Um, this, you know, I think documentary has borrowed um, a lot from the way narratives have been financed. Uh, uh, you know, it was unthinkable I think 15 years ago to, to, see, to think, you know, projects would be financed through pre-sales to all right distributors or um, have even soft money from, you know, BFI or as often was the case in France and other European countries. So in many ways, it's been really good as what's coming, which is... Uh, where is all this going? And I think it's true that the fact that we have now more um, players, uh, Disney Plus coming, Apple, uh, Netflix, Amazon, but they are all, one wonders and thinks, okay, that means it's gonna be more competition, There's, it's gonna be better for independent producers to find ways to, you know, for the film to be seen. But if the trend is that everyone is going into their own original um, production rather than acquisition, uh, then, I mean, what I see coming is that completed films will find it harder to, to get finance and to be sold than maybe the projects. I think the marketplace now is, is much stronger at project stage. So the role of sort of co-production markets and the role of getting people involved earlier on, you think, is going to become more prevalent, it's more key. important. It's going to be key. And projects... There will be a market for completed films, but it's going to... I think it will shrink. Great. OK, we'll come, we'll come back to that. That's great. Uh, Lisa Marie, I know last year when we were here, we... Um, complained about how much little money you had, but, and then you managed to go and get some more. Perhaps you could give us a sort of update on sort of the last year. Of the yes, so we yeah. have a million, uh, a million pounds to spend now, and we've uh, financed 18 films. We haven't actually announced the, the last round, or the third round, but that's coming soon, and uh, 10 short films, and that's partial funding. And um, we also have just relaunched the year two of Made of Truth, which is the shorts that can go up to 40 minutes. 
The shorts are a uh, grant. They're not alone. The features are alone, but with the features, we don't take rights. So we're a re really easy partner to work with. Um, we had two shorts in the festival, the masses and the circle, so they're the first two films out of the fund. Um, I think some of the, just to you know, put some things in there for people to think about, some of the things we've kind of discovered over the course of this year, uh, it's really hard for people to cash flow their tax credit, meaning the, the players that do that to support people charge a lot for that relative to the size of a documentary budget. And we want to look at that and actually hear from people about what, what's making it difficult because people need that money. It's part of their, their finance plan. Um, we also would like to see more players getting in early. We go in early. We take the risks. We support the BFI diversity targets and... Um, we want other people to do that with us because people need more than just what we can give them. We also see that producers need a lot of support around contracting, uh, legals, anything to do with financing. And I, I think just as a <clears throat> person who's worked in fiction film as well, I, I think maybe that happens because there's a really uh, bit more of a clear trajectory if you were producing in that where you might have been around it a lot and there's more money swilling around it. People come to documentary from all different ways and we have a great business affairs exec called Christine Howard and she really helps people right from the get-go and we issue template contracts. But sometimes we'll see things that we're coming into and we realize people don't have the rights that they think they have. But we want to help people get that all sorted really early on so that when it goes to Anna, <laughs> they actually have the rights cleared because they can't really get onto the market without having all that lined up. So I, I think we need some more support in the UK for, for producer training. And just that, yeah, that reminder of what um, Mandy was saying is that people don't, you know, they don't pop out of the womb fully formed. James Marsh, Paul Greengrass, Jeannie Finley. These people all started with, with public su support of public money and nurturing that creativity. And we also, we think that's, we need other people to help us. We need more broadcasters. Where's Channel 4 in this space? What up? <laughs> Used to be here, not here. Um, we work really well with Mandy and Storyville, and we have some projects together and are always really looking at our slate about what, what could work. Doc Society does a project which people are probably aware of called Good Pitch, and it's international now, and we help bring projects to uh, financing opportunities and partnering opportunities. It's not always cash, and it might be NGOs, charities, philanthropists, and we'd like to look at maybe doing another a Good Pitch UK. Um, and we try to do that in a mini way with our, our grantees, but not just the people that we grant, um, people that come to us. We All day Friday we had a drop-in session where one-to-ones where we give advice and hear about films people want to make, and we also do that with the road shows. So, yes, the door is open for talking. Thank you very <laughs> much. I mean, th this question of sort of roots through for talent, you know, you know, people starting off wanting to get through. You know, we do live in this time of overabundance, you know, the digital, you know, sort of landscape. There's so much material. It's very easy for filmmakers to get lost, feel lost, not get the attention they deserve, not get the support they deserve. I mean, how do you, the three of you see, you know, the sort of, you know, what would be your advice to somebody starting out today about how to best approach, you know, there's somebody setting out to make their first feature doc, what are your top tips for them? Watch films. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my advice. I mean, it's also coming to festivals like this, immersing yourselves in the film, coming to the talks, meeting. You know, it, people are accessible at these things. Mm. We're accessible. Haley and I are very accessible. And, I mean, we don't want people pitching to us in the toilet, but... You know, we, 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 we're out there and we, we, we talk to people. We've got a website that has, you know, that pretty much lays out how we want people to present stuff to us, um, present their ideas and projects to us. We have an online submissions form and, and it means that even, even though, you know, we, we do get snowed under and looking at stuff is the biggest thing because when you get a, a full film, that's 90 minutes and there's, you know, there's a lot of work in that. But... Um, you know, it's the submission form is good because we know when projects have come in, we've got a good record of them. We're actually, you know, fixing it up at the moment so that people can keep adding to it and keep adding material to it and or, you know, change their treatments. What, and what stands out for you? What makes a project stand out for you? 
Um, I think... What are the qualities you're looking for in a project? Cinematic, definitely cinematic. Uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's kind of the domestic market in this country and we need to be distinctive and different from that. So we want provocative, global... We have to be global. We, our, our films have to have an, ish, an international appeal because they're not fully funded. So the money has to come from all kinds of sources. Yeah. And it comes from Europe, it comes from America, it comes from the BFI, it comes from not-for-profit organisations, sometimes philanthropy. Um, it comes from all, all sorts of places. And, and filmmakers are very resourceful at finding those pots of money. And we help people find those pots of money as well. You know, we're, we're constantly... I mean, that's one of our biggest jobs, is helping people partner up with others who might be interested in their film and, and, and to help them find the financial support that they need to close the finances. I mean, to, to come to you on, about, uh, on, the, on the subject of money, you know, I know that sort of in a way, I've, I've spoken to a few people in, in, in the build-up to this panel where, you know, we've kind of slightly passed a, a heyday. Like three, four years ago, I had one person say to me, you know, films I was selling to the SFODs for, you know, to Netflix, for example, for four million a few years ago, you know, I'll be lucky to get 400 or 500 K now. There's that narrowing. There's not that sort of chucking money at things to win awards and get prestige and build a brand. They've got data now. They kind of know what they want. So there's that sort of narrowing. But at the same time, players like yourself are, and Submarine and various other distributors are coming in early with your own production funding now and getting into the production game. So can you tell from your perspective sort of, you know, what your tips are about sort of money, but also presenting to a, you know, a distributor such as yourself, both for distribution, but also potentially for production funding? Well, I think if you are a producer or first-time filmmaker, producer, I think the best way to, to go about is to come to places like this, the main market or uh, IFA Forum, CPH. You need to, I think it's a great platform to, to have your project out there and to, to, for you to start meeting, you know, decision makers and to test, you know, the interest on, on the project idea. If you are not there yet, I would recommend just teaming up with other producers. There mm -hmm. are producers that are all the time coming here so to, to pick up projects to co-produce with, you know. So you might have a great idea or you might have access to, to some of I mean, We did Vivian Westwood mm -hmm. uh, documentary in the UK, and you know the filmmaker was pretty much a first-time filmmaker on the future land. But she had this great access to, to Vivian and, you know, and was able to film her, and Vivian trusted her. Um, kind of changed everything <laughs> once the film was finished, but... Uh, <laughs> it was, <laughs> she wanted more the ecological rather than the, the typical portrait. But that was a great example because we, what we did is um, team up Lorna with uh, Passion Pictures and John Batsik and kind of um, basically pr pretty much pre sold. Oh, so all you helped to kind of put that together? Yeah, we right. put that together and, and then we were very much involved in, in financing, in, in pre-selling, but what she had was a great character and access to a great character. So that's what really makes a difference, especially for first-time producers, for makers, to so have something that is unique. That is that to say that famous people sell? Obviously. Right. <laughs> I mean, everyone, even broadcasters, you know, we're all mad about uh, the Michael Jackson documentary is, and, you know, public broadcasters and pay TV broadcasters, famous selves, and there is a clear audience there. I mean, I, I agree, we all want documentaries of all types, uh, but it's precisely those documentaries that also help to create more audience for documentaries yeah. and, and to make documentaries popular overall. Um, but that was something that was quite unique. So my recommendation would be to, to always send the projects to, to, to the forums um, and talk to producers or broadcasters. You know, I mean, Mandy does a great job, I agree. You know, whenever she finds a project, she doesn't just commit to, with the BBC, but she knows everyone in the US, in Europe, and she 
really tries to, to get support from other broadcasters. So it's always about trying to see who you can partner with. Uh, it might be a distributor or agency, it might be a broadcaster, or it might be an experienced producer, you know, that has, mm, you know, lots of experience in corporate Relationships, using. partnerships, connect with other people. Especially producers. when you are starting. I mean, it's really hard to... C to can I say something else to that? I think it's really important that people lean into us like we lean into them, where they actually understand what we're looking for. And it's all out there. You know, you watch the, you watch the films. I'm sure you've, you, you've got a website that kind of gives advice about what the parameters yeah. are for BFI, of what, what they're looking for, just as we do. You know, there are certain... I get, I get pictures all the time where people say, oh, I've got a three-part series about sharks. It's like, well, I don't want that. You know, it's not... This is, that is not Storyville. And it's, 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 a, it's a respect thing, and we really respect it when people take the time to find out what the kind of things we're looking for. And what we're looking for is quite broad, but there are just some things that we, we, we don't take and we can't take. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, manage your fantasies, uh, uh, <laughs> really, because, yes, you know, before you come to us, really read the guidelines look at the cultural test, understand all of that. I mean, you can ask us about it, but not <laughs> because you haven't done your homework. Do the homework and then go, mm. you know, I didn't understand that. I don't understand this about the cultural test, why I need to have 18 out of 34 points so that I qualify for UK public money. Um, you know, those answers to those questions are out there. I also think in that um, your point about pairing up 100%, and we can help people do that, but also if there are people in the room that are um, short film producers or want to be short film producers, there's really not enough people out there. We were really surprised when we picked the last round and we paired up some, some projects with producers. We had to look really hard to find the great people that we have, but... There are those kind of opportunities out there. I think w to answer the question of, um, you know, what we're looking for, um, I think originality. When I hear a story that I have never heard before, we have one film called Maya, which is about an Iranian tiger trainer. And it's an Iranian director who has partnered with a UK director. And I think, wow, something about Iran that's not about nuclear war. We have a couple films about the post-colonial experience, the story that keeps on rumbling on all over the world. That's a few that are features, and one that's a, a short as well. And um, just to go back to your term, cinematic, um, how do we define that? And it's, you know, it's a universality in the story, but also it could be a look, but it's also about um, storytelling arcs and access and character. And I, I think sometimes people aren't really grasping that. They might mm. have an interesting world they've stumbled into, but it might be better served in, a, in an hour television program that's an overview on a subject and quite a respectable thing to be doing. If your program belongs on TV, then great and great to have a, a probably decent budget and an opportunity and outlet and access to, a, to an audiences. But really, if you want to be making um, cinematic documentaries, you need to be watching them and you need to think about, you know, where your film fits into that world. And if you haven't thought about that, to us it would be a signal that you're not really ready to be making films that go out into that world. I think this is a, a good moment to sort of actually watch some, some images. So <laughs> perhaps we could start with um, the story mm. reel. Can I, could, before we do, do that, that up, yeah. can, I, can I just... So, so we had a launch last night and we... We've, we've rebranded Storyville because we're, we're moving on to BBC Three. We're st our home is still BBC Four, but we thought there was an amazing opportunity for 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 films for younger people, for feature length films that you know that that fulfil all the needs that they have, that are kind of world class, um, authentic, that relate to them and their world. And so um, we we you know as of I think it's the 23rd of June. We're, we're dropping three films, Minding the Gap, um, Roll Red Roll, which is a brilliant story about a college rape um, that we partnered up with Doc Society on and, 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 and other, you know, that has other funders. The PBS in the States is showing it. 
um, POV. Is that going to mean a slight, uh, in terms of your future commissioning, are you going to be sort of leaning more towards... No, I mean, we're still doing all of the things we always have done, but we're just moving into that space because it's, a, it's an opportunity and, and we, t we took it. And, and there is... Young people watch feature docs. They love, look at... I mean, look at all the audiences here at Sheffield. Incredibly young. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a way of growing people into the, into the other strand yeah. because, because if, if people don't, you know, l learn to look at those long-form films... Develop audiences as much as you do talent, absolutely. Yes. So, so, anyway, so as part of that, we did a montage of Storyville's past and, and present and the ones coming up. Um, we just put it together as a celebration of, you know, fabulous filmmakers, right. fabulous films. Let's Thank we, you. Could we have the uh, story of reel? Thank you. Thank you. So that last, f that last shot is a film that's on here tonight, with, uh, and it's about Kate Nash, and it's one of the BBC Three films, and she's performing here tonight, so if anyone wants to come along and hear... <laughs> I, don't, I, I mean, I think it's a big space. I don't, I don't think, I think it's, it's in this space. space. I, I think, think it's in the other space. Yeah, right. And they're worried about the space not being filled. So I thought I'd give it a bit of a shout out. Great, yeah. brilliant. Um, I'm going to actually just sort of open up, just see if there's... Could you just have the lights up a little bit, just see if there are any questions at this stage? If not, we'll sort of rock on. But if anyone has got a question, do feel free to... So there's a gentleman there. Could you just wait for the mic, because we're recording the session. There's a gentleman at the back there. If there's any others, we could take a quick round of questions at this stage and sort of come back into the panel. Thank you. Could you just tell us who you are as well, please? Yeah, I'm James. I'm a video producer on the tools. Um, my question is, do you think there's a place for um, feature documentaries on social media platforms such as Facebook? Mm. Um, I know that they've rolled out recently ad breaks, which obviously means that the more people that view that piece of content, the more money that it makes. So I was just putting that out there. Well, I always think filmmakers need to be paid for their work. <laughs> and so if it's, if it's about ha something being up there for free, um, the answer is no. But um, it's a very powerful medium, and it, we, we, we use it to, um, to promote our films and, and, and stuff about our films, and I'm sure your films and your films yeah. appear on Facebook. Um, but, you know, the public service broadcaster is also... I mean, it's not free because we all have to pay for it, but, but it is a brilliant and amazing organisation because it, it is all about audience and we make films for the audience and we have a relationship with our audience. But Facebook is a money-making organisation. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a really good question. Yeah, well, if someone else is making money on your work, you should be making money. I suppose that's what... I, I think they are starting <laughs> now to commission as well. well. This is the bigger point, I suppose, that James' question touches on, is technological change has come for the entire media landscape. So I suppose, I, I, you know, what are your views about the changes that are happening now, which are very rapid? You know, what do, what, what do you think's going to happen? Are we going to be moving to sort of monetized Facebook views where everybody gets well, a I think, First of all, I think... I think not that we have worked with them, but I know of producers that have been commissioned by Facebook to do kind of short series. They are kind of the five minutes or ten minutes, you know, ten parts on topics that have a strong following on Facebook, whatever that might be. I can't remember now exactly the specific project, but I think Julie Godman had something going mm. on with them. So they are starting to commission and by that, I guess, you know, paying for, for the licensing of those rights. Um, with regards to your question was new. Well, I suppose, you know, we, we live in an attention economy now. You know, if you can get people's attention, you can find some way to monetize it. And but that's, that's but I just want to say something else to that, which is that, you know, there's a thing called rights <laughs> and music rights and the rights of using archive and we're very diligent about that and we have editorial policies to make sure that, that people who are in those films are, are looked after, that there's a duty of care towards the people in the films and platforms like Facebook do not have that. You know, I mean, this has been evolved over a long period of time at the BBC and it's a often a pain in the arse to deal with, but it's really, really important. And that people's legal rights are, 
are protected and that those, those other rights that come with a film when you have lots of archive, when you have musicians, that's really, really important. And if it becomes a free-for-all, it, it's, it's, you know, I mean, filmmakers will, will do what they want, but I think if other people are making money off the back of somebody else's intellectual property and work... I, I don't. I don't approve of that, and I don't agree with it. I 100% agree with that. You know, people make work and um, should be paid to do that, and other people's using of that uh, should be cleared properly, unless it is in another context where it can be used because of its relevance to journalism. But uh, and it's a generational thing as well. But I think people should think about themselves and their own careers and their own work. Do you want to be in a world where you're not paid for your work, where you're not getting compensated for it, where you're, and where these, where what we do is not a job, it's but just a hobby? But then that's fine, that's at the moment. But yeah. the possibility is that very soon there will be mechanisms by which both legal issues around rights and the issues of payment in terms of micropayments will mm. be resolved. These things are being prototyped. I, d I don't think it's just about rights. I mean, it is about rights, but it's also about independent filmmaking. And by that, what I mean is, you know, is there a conflict of interest about the money that's been put into that film? You know, that's another area we have to do real due diligence on. We can't, you know, you can't have um, Ford making a film about Ford right. car, you know, putting money into a film about Ford cars or Coca-Cola putting into a money into a a film about Coke. It's like the Fire Island thing, the Fire Island program on Netflix, you know. The, the marketing company who, who were marketing that, that whatever holiday package, whatever it was, That's event, it, yeah. that they, they made the film. Now, I, I'm not sure we would have been allowed to do that at the BBC because there would have been a clear conflict of interest. Well, that's why we have to protect journalism, respect journalism, understand what it is. Um, you know, Donald Trump and fake news and all of that undermines all of that, and those things are part of what keeps a democracy strong and alive, and it is connected to the work that we're doing. If films are paid for by someone that has a conflict of interest, then that is advertising, then that is branded content, then that mm -hmm. is designed to get you to buy something. Okay, we live in a capitalist world where that happens, mm -hmm. but that should not be confused with journalism or creative documentary or storytelling that does not have that agenda of just making but, money. But you say that but at the same time, you know, whether it's a commercial agenda or whether it's a <laughs> civic society agenda. I mean, with The Good Pitch, for example, you are working with organizations with very clear agendas. Yeah, but that's all... Uh, it's non-commercial, but... Yeah, but that's <laughs> totally different. I mean, that's so, you know, that would be social justice. That would be out there. That would be clear. That would, it's not right. hidden in the it's background. The on the and it isn't about them making a load of money and right. using that format as basically an advert, right. an extended advert. Any other questions? Sorry, just, just one second. Uh, I'm just going to go to the lady there in the fourth row, and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Alexandra. I'm from Broadcast Magazine's Commissioner Index. Mm -hmm. um, Mandy, I've got a question for you. Um, now that you're moving to BBC Three, how does that affect um, the target audience? Do filmmakers have to uh, look at topics that speak to a 1634 audience specifically? Yes. I mean, BBC, the BBC Three audience is 16 to 34 years, and so it has to be things that, you know, are relatable to that audience and that that audience kind of is interested in. It's, it's I mean, and, the, and we, you know, one of the things that happens is that th that audience will also find the other stuff on BBC Four because, and that's the beauty of just having more content, more content online, more content on, on, on linear TV, on BBC Four. But it, the, the point is that it is content. It's, it's films for a young audience. It's long-form films for a young audience. Great, thank you. And the just gentleman and then the gentleman at the back from the back row there. Oh. Simon Soul, Bandula Productions. <laughs> Very much enjoying being called young. Thank you for that. Um, I, you, I've, we heard a lot that you like to be involved early and then there's, uh, you know, you work together. That phrase comes up a lot at this festival. I mean, and you've answered it in general, but specifically, what are the things that you want 
that get resisted? Because obviously it's potentially a difficult conversation. What are the things, the, the difficult conversations you have with producers where they've turned up with a particular feature or a particular idea and you'll say, no, no, actually that's not going to work. Can you tell us about those kind of sort of tension points and how they're resolved and what, what are they mostly about? Well, we're, we're not commissioners. Do you know, I mean, uh, uh, the BFI Doc Society Fund in that we are looking to make things that fill slots. We are financiers, part financiers that come into to a film at a particular time. So I th that's a slightly different thing, I think. But w what producers, uh, for example, when we say, you know, we preference um, stories that, have, that are in the UK or that resonate with the UK, that British directors or directors living in, um, directors that live in the UK, there's a whole, and then someone brings you a kind of cop story that's set in America that could and should be funded out of America, that it doesn't really fit with the fund. So for us, it's part of it's just about what the criteria of the fund are <coughs> and you know how we're reflecting back this experience out culturally, because we have a cultural imperative with the film. I suppose one thing I see that I am really trying to dissuade people of is overinflated budgets. Um, so it's not really for me to say that you can't make that budget, that film for six or seven hundred thousand pounds. But if you are never going to be able to raise that amount of money on the market, what happens is we still keep talking about this budget that is too big and it's in your finance plan and then you're going to the market and then I'm sure other people are saying in the market, why do you need that much money? How are you ever going to raise that much money? It kind of distorts the conversation. So just get your budget where it should be, what you realistically need to make the film, what you realistically can raise, and what you um, could be paid to do that within the confines of this project. So I think that's one of my big areas of advice. And it does, I think it does hurt a film when you don't get real... <coughs> quick and early on in the in the mm. journey. Amanda, would you like to speak to that question? We get oh God knows how many proposals we get every month, but it's a lot. We get over a thousand um, people submitting their ideas a year, a lot more than that. And it's it's you know, we have to say no a lot. Um, because, you know, there's only about 18... On BBC Four, there's about 18 to 20 Storyvilles a year, give or take. And so, you know, if you're, if you're looking at, say, 1,500 proposals, you, you can work out how many no's we have to... And, that, and that's not just the ones that are formally submitted. It's, it's people at, at markets kind of pitching their films. And so it's, so it's you know, the, the, I think the... the the, the benchmark is pretty high um, because we have a standard of excellence. And, and, and what I try and do is encourage people not to come in with a 20-page um, treatment and, you know, and having done a hell of a lot of work because there might be another film being made about that sub very subject or you know, it just might not, be, it might not be something for us. I'd rather people kind of have a quick conversation about... or send me a quick email or, you know, submit something that, that gives me a snapshot of what, what their film is. But also them, because I think just as important as the idea is the person who's making it um, and what they've done and what their passion is for the subject, what the access is, um, the, the way they've thought about how they're going to make the film. Because people write these essays and actually I, I, I don't want an essay. I want, I want to know what their vision is for the film. So it's it's not it's not an it's not an easy answer, but it, and it's not easy saying no to no to people, you know, because it's heartbreaking for some people when you say no to them. Um, I think early no is easy. That's not my, my yeah. question's more is about once you're into it, you probably have conversations. You get yeah. Resistance. We track a lot of stuff. We're tracking about seventy-five f because we don't know if they're going to la you know if if they're going to have the legs to become a feature doc because it takes a lot. I think Lisa Marie put it really well, to make a, a cinema doc, there's a lot of elements that have to go into it for it to be a cinema doc um, and, to, and to hold on a big screen and to sustain an audience over 90 minutes. Um, so, so sometimes things need to be, to be tracked and we, we'll give people a little bit of development money. 
But you know, if, if, it, if, it's, a, if it's a definite, no, we'll, we'll try and come back as quickly as we can. And sometimes that's not easy, but we, we, we try. I think you might, sorry. I'm going to move on. Okay, just, fine. Is that, that, does that answer your question? Thank you. If we go to Krish at the back there. Thank you. Ah, yeah, Krish, sorry, Krish and Aurora um, uh, from SBS Australia. It's a public channel. Um, I am just uh, wanted to ask a question about durations. I mean, in an online world where things can kind of be any length and uh, uh, the audience doesn't really mind whether it's 23 minutes or 37 minutes, it needs to be the length of the film. Uh, are we and the funding systems that support what is called feature documentary, are we too wedded to that magic 90-minute number? Well, it's a, it can be a lot short. I mean, our guidelines say 69. When I made, um, I was executive producer on of Time in the City, and all the sales agents were saying 71, 72. Do you think 69 is a little short for a documentary? I mean, for future length, is short. In, I know in the States, many distributors would reject, uh, all right distributors would reject a film if it's like 70 minutes. Less than 70. Thinking it's 76 as a minimum. Yeah. Uh, future length. Yeah. And um, we, uh, what I'm really excited about, as well as the shorts, our shorts can go up to 40 minutes. And that was, in part, came out of conversations with um, Charlie Phillips and The Guardian. And I think particularly anyone making short films should be watching The Guardian films during their lunch times religiously. Uh, because sometimes documentaries need that extra amount of time to be impactful. So we're working across that time range. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see um, the feature space chiseled away. I think, the, you know, just responding to the thing about mm. short form content. Like, we live in a really complex world. I go to bed every night with a newspaper still trying to understand Brexit. Like, <laughs> um, you know, these features you give us... our Brexit films. <laughs> 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 giving us this opportunity to engage with ideas and in a in a longer space we need that engagement there's a real risk of of trying to reduce everything to a kind of soundbite <laughs> and what about this difference between you know the sort of experience i mean to, to carry on from chris the, the, yeah. the very experience of watching feature docs and the idea of whether we're watching them at home in our big you know sort of flat screens or with that collective experience of actually being in the cinema and the theater i mean what do, what do you think is um, happening well, to that? Well, I think that's where the curation comes in. And, you know, I keep saying 90 minutes, but it's not... We're not prescriptive about that. If something needs to be 80 minutes, it will be 80 minutes. And, or if something is over 90 minutes because it sustains that and it's brilliant, it, it can be longer. And sometimes we cut things down to an hour because they might work on a big screen as, as 90 or 80 or whatever they are, but they're, they're not going to work on TV as that. So we'll... we'll will work with the producer or the director to cut, cut that film down. So if somebody's got a, a film with which initially you know, you're part of, but it is going to have an initial theatrical run, be it for commercial reasons or be it for award sort of qualification reasons, would you then possibly shorten that version or how would you sort of coordinate? It depends on the film. You know, like the, the TV audience is a different audience to the people who come to the cinema and they're, you know, they're in a darkened room and they, they're, it's, you know, it's immersive. We want to capture their attention and keep it while they're watching that film. And some things can be paced out more. Some things just need pacing up or just, you know. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, we love and support people making feature doc, their feature docs for the cinema and yeah. festivals. And we want them to have that, we want them to have that rung. Not, not too long, but, yeah. you know, but, but, but we also want it to work for TV as well, which is a very different medium with a different, audience. I mean, Anna, you know, you guys are sort of specialist in theatrical documentary. What, what's working in the theatrical space, in the cinemas? What's what, working in terms of what's making money? I think you just have to kind of check the box office. Which, which, can you well, tell us? In which, the which, US, which, which, you which have been your most successful <laughs> films over the last two years? Obviously, Free Solo last year. I think that was an old time record. Um, we are working with Nigel. Uh, it's, it wasn't the first one. We do the theatrical releases in the UK. We are now starting to do international sales as well for Sea of Shadows. Um, Can you give us an idea how much, how much sort of free solo? Did it have a good run in the cinemas? It was in the two States? million. How much? Two million pounds box office. In the UK? In the UK. Oh, wow. 
So. And what do you put that down to? Is it the fact that it's so visceral? Has everybody seen Free Solo? <laughs> you know, it's it's you know, it's this little sort of climb, and it's quite. I mean, it's quite a thing, isn't it? It's like I mean, I was sort of watching from behind the sofa, sort of thing. Do you think it's that experiential aspect that makes it so successful? that people can go and have this really immersive... Yes, it's like watching a thriller in yeah. <laughs> the climbing world. Yeah, it's the way it was shot, it's, it's how the narrative unfolds and the tension. And I think it was also very timely, um, premiere in Toronto, and it was released in the US, and it just got into that kind of Oscar run. So once did, it gets did the Oscar make a big difference to the box office? I assume it did. I think it did. And the best. I always does. I'm and it won the best. But it yes, was marketed to death. Yes. I mean, I have to say, I felt it was over-marketed. As a BAFTA voter, they wouldn't stop with the, you have to watch this, you have to watch this, you have to watch this. And that's got to be part of what gets people into the cinema. And I mean, it's a National yeah. Geographic yeah. film. Everyone knows that. So it's kind of... Nadia teams up locally with different distributors to release films theatrically, as they did with Jane. So they are very much behind, and the marketing team that they also, you know, they bring uh, great support. Uh, so that obviously yeah. makes no, and it's uh, great. Hopefully, difference. it wasn't your money; their money. They were spending. It was as well. Oh. It was a combination, <laughs> but it was is the combination that makes the, the difference. But I think it's not just the money in this case. I think, again, it just it coincided with, you know, what was happening in the U.S., the Oscar run. And then it was, it's an audience, please, you know, please. We had done Mountain, I think, the year before, and we had also core audience there of people that love mountains or are into climbing, so it was right. very easy for us to target. I mean, this question, you know, this is the, I mean, I've got, you know, the front, I don't know if the Francis brothers are here, but the Francis brothers, who are regulars at the festival, their last film, which is about Thichnat Than at Plum Village, the Buddhist monk, you know, they've, they've, hyped, they've marketed that into that very deep niche of Buddhist meditators, of whom there are millions around the world, <laughs> well, and who don't get many films. And that film, in, sort of in a very independent way, has been extremely profitable for them. You know, they, they were last seen sort of with a tan, drinking lattes on Broadway Market, you know, sort of looking, <laughs> looking more relaxed than I've seen them in years. <laughs> So I suppose I'm wondering about this thing of, in terms of marketing and niches, how, you know, what does the, the, the fact that we've got this sort of interaction between cinema and online spaces that opens up the possibility to market into deep niches, is that something that opens up new audiences? Is that something you guys are thinking about when you're commissioning and funding films? I think it's very different for theatrical than TV. Uh, I mean, in some cases, there is a crossover, of course, and usually what works theatrically as Free Solo or Three Identical Strangers will also work on TV because uh, there has been that press and that marketing campaign around it, and people just know about it. But, but that's one of my bugbears when there's too much of a gap between, you know, the film... I, I, wanna, I, wa I don't want to wait a year or more for that film to go out on TV. I want, to, I want people to have their theatrical release and, and their festival. But every time I say to... Nine times out of ten when I say to a filmmaker, what's your, what's your festival plan? They don't have one. Mm. Or they say Sundance. Mm. <laughs> you know? And so people really need to think about that and think about that in terms of where the TV... Tra you know, where the yeah. TV screening is going to fall, yeah. Yeah. what their plan is, and not leave it too long, because yeah. then it becomes... It starts to feel really old, and, yeah. you know, it's, a lot of these films are very topical. You know, they're of the moment, and, and we want them to go out while they're of the moment on television. So, what, and so Anna, what are the tricks in terms of creating, you know, that, that thing everybody wants, buzz? You know, what's the best way for an independent filmmaker to st with no money to start to create a bit of buzz around their project? Is it going to markets and talking to everybody? What's the, what's the way to start getting a bit of buzz around your film? Get them into it, depends, it depends on the topic, first of all, and it depends on what kind of idea that you, you have. You know, if it's uh, something social justice, human rights, if it's character-driven, if it's something with a specific niche or it falls into arts and culture. I think it's identifying what type of project you have, whether it's something with theatrical potential or TV or 
And again, going back, teaming up with someone else, you know, it might be a producer, it might be a broadcaster, it might be a distributor to kind of help and, and start right. the process. Great, brilliant. I'm going to just, we're going to get to show uh, a, a teaser for a film that Lisa Marie is going to set up. And then after that, we've got about 20 minutes left. We're going to sort of open it up for questions for the rest of the time. So we're going to watch this teaser. And then if you've all got questions, we'll spend the last 15 minutes talking to those. And I'll come to you first, Meta. Would you like to set up this clip? Uh, the film is called Is There Anybody Out There? And it started as um, Ella Glendinning, who's a, a young woman um, with dwarfism in, for her so search for people that had her particular form of dwarfism, which is quite rare. And then something else happened in her life. Unexpected. <laughs> Oh, that looks beautiful. Thanks. So I, I, I've, got a, I've got a profoundly banal question to ask yeah. after such a profound yeah. thing. D in terms of delivery, yeah. does everybody need to deliver in like super duper 8K, HD, super? Or can, I mean, in terms of these sorts of personal films, a lot of first-time filmmakers will be making films which are personal films. What about sort of tech specs and for formals? You know, can, can that be worked around? Can people master to HD and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. And is that the same for you? Mm -hmm. And what about, what about in terms of... Uh... I think we ask for DCPs and yeah. ProRes. Yeah. Um, is that... You can work around <laughs> that. Fine. But, you know, we get yeah, to that stage. It, it grows to meet the need, but there's yeah. a really basics of, of right. what we need to, right. yeah, to get it in the in house. I mean, some films are made with, on people's iPhones. Yeah, yes. exactly, yeah. But yeah. they're very powerful. Yeah. yeah. And Storm. some films is purely archive from all sources. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mystify yeah. has archive from six, 60 mil and digital. Right. And OK, yeah. great. Let, let's open it up. Could we have the house lights up, please? And um, I think the Messer there in the third row had a question there. Let's go to the mess first. And then if anybody else has got an, it's another question, we can sort of... And if you could send the mic up to the back there afterwards, and then this gentleman there. Right, go. Yeah, I think I'm going a little bit back because you said at the time when you talked about Facebook and streaming that everybody needs attention, there's this attention seeking. But in my experience, uh, we just did Why Slavery with the 70 public service TV stations around the world, um, is that basically the, the, the platforms where you can really, really reach huge number of people, which we do have to do nowadays, right, because we also need to reach Mrs. Smith in Texas who are homeschooling her kids and the, maybe the Middle England who, you know, we, we need to reach these people and not just speak to ourselves. But, I mean, one of our films had, I think, four million uh, viewers on Panorama at BBC. You know, broadcasters can trail uh, these important stories and this was about modern day slavery, but still, you know, it's a, uh, it's a lot of people and I'm sure you won't get that in one, I mean, if you go on, I don't know, one of the streaming services, four million just in England is very, very difficult to, to get. And the whole thing about the streaming is also you don't know who is watching it and how many. So I think that we, as an industry, we need to be much more... Um, concerned about who we work with or also how the business structure is but obviously also who is watching our films or are there anyone watching our films on the streaming services the whole transparency who's earning the money on our films and all, all these things obviously i'm a former <laughs> public service i really think public service is the most important and particular in these days where you know it's hard uh, and we also have to remember that you know half of the world's population don't have access to internet and they only speak a local language so we need to to work with free access information which is still the public service tv stations yeah yeah no i think you know i think public service broadcasting is sort of I mean, yeah, it, you know it, 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 it's it's under a lot of pressure but it seems mm. i think that's quite right it's sort of never been more important you know, sort of. mm. is that something that sort of your one's aware of within the video. No, t totally. I mean, it, 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 everybody is is totally focused on it and focused on how we survive in this in this market where all these commercial players, where the commercial imperative is the bottom line. How we survive, how we survive that, how we continue to attract the best talent, and and you know, I think the BBC is an amazing organisation with a, a fantastic legacy. But it, you know, I mean. 
my heart nearly broke when, when David Attenborough went to, you know, went, went to Netflix because, and, you know, he had good reasons for it. You know, he said, I'm going, it's, it, you know, I will, I will be on platforms, you know, on, in I don't know how many countries, 70 other countries. Um, but, but also we, uh, we, I say we, the BBC nurtured and, and, and supported David Attenborough throughout his career, and I and I and I feel like, um, what was it called? Planet. Our planet. Our planet yeah. was a was a was an imitation, and it was you know I mean it had an environmental element to it, but it wasn't it wasn't anything that the BBC hadn't done before. It just had a lot more money pour, poured into it, and you know he is he is the face and the heart and the soul of the BBC, or he's one of the faces, and so. That you know, when 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 all that kind of poaching has has an impact on, on us, and you know, it's like who's who's going to be ta- who's going to go next? And it's not just the people in front of the screen. The the the, the man who um, who you know who who executive produced all those beautiful pl- Blue Planet films. He he made our planet. I mean, so he I, I, went I, I, too. I, I, and you can't you can't blame these people. You know. BBC created BBC Studios, yeah. and so he set up his own production company. He saw. I mean, on the plus side, in the plus side, in terms of Meta's time. point, there's you know there is this you know I, I mean I'm partic- I'm excited by the creation of what feels like a sort of genuinely global commons. That is the sort of plus side of the cultural impact of mm. global broadcasters is the fact that I have just global a little issues, comment yeah. to, to that, uh, Mandy, because I think what happened there was that BBC basically privatised their. Natural. That's no. That's know, what I'm a, saying. And then, and it's just, but you know, for what's his name, the old guy, to say he would be on 70, um, <laughs> 70 countries, he would be that anyway. BBC Natural History has always sold their big uh, blueprint stories to all the public service stations in the world, and he would actually have had many more viewers had he had this film been on uh, public service in Denmark, in Spain, and. Japan or whatever. So it's actually a completely mad story because he would have had many, many more viewers had it stayed at public service TV stations. Thank you, Metro. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, I think it was this gentleman next, and then, uh, so yeah, if you'd like to go. Yeah, my name is Peter. I'm from Kenya, and uh, my question is about international stories. In terms of the, what you're saying about, I'm here, yeah. about globalization and uh, global stories. So for Mandy and Lisa Marie, is, uh, is the, your, your, your criteria for funding stories, if I have a story that is very local to an African context or another country, do I need a co-production with a UK producer or some crew in the UK for me to qualify for the funding? And again, if... Uh, for the story, does it need a specific cultural threshold? For, for example, you said that your audience is 16 to 34. Do I need to include certain elements that will meet the, uh, the, the test of that audience? And if I meet that, I might end up missing out on the theatrical market audience because it seems that for the theatrical market, the more local you get, the more global you, can, you have potential to become. So how, how do I work right. that out? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, I know for you. It's well, very do much you know about DocuBox in Kenya? Yeah. yeah. So, there, DocuBox is an organization that's like Doc Society, but working in Kenya and across Africa. And but for, 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 yeah. the, for the fund, yes. you, you've got to have is it, it's UK specific. But yeah. would you be able to, uh, if a Kenyan filmmaker wanted to work in partnership with a British filmmaker? Would uh, sure. They? I mean, if you you if you. You know, you can do a co-production as well, and you have to meet certain criteria for that to get access to our funding. Or, um, you, you know, it depends on how you pass the cultural test. But there's a couple ways to do that. So then it would be about what, what in your story is uh, relevant and connected to the UK. And you know, we find that many stories in Africa are. So, you know, happy to talk to you about that. Great, Wendy. No, so we're a totally global strand, and um, we we fund and support filmmakers from all over the world. And more and more, I am really keen to um, find filmmakers 
making films about the countries they are from, so African filmmakers, <laughs> Middle Eastern filmmakers. Two meetings straight after this session. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and they take flat white. <laughs> um, <laughs> next question. I'll uh, go to that gentleman there in the middle, and then we'll go to this lady here. Thanks, um, Josh. Uh, I'm a freelance director producer. Um, Mandy, a question for you. Uh, Brexit behind closed doors mm. was amazing uh, access in that. I just wondered, out of the thousand plus ideas you get, how many um, how many do you get where there's truly genuine access like that, and how much of it depends on. The, uh, the director, or is it always a no-brainer if you have something like that? Um, well, it's Brexit didn't, wasn't, you know, it started before my time, and I, I looked after it. Um, but, I mean, access is such a key part of what I think all of us do, and having access to a story is, is, is crucial, and that's, you know, that's sometimes why we track things, because we want to find out what the access is. Um... And, I mean, he did have extraordinary access and he was a completely one-man band and not really a... No, a, a I mean, he'd made films. Loda Desmet was the filmmaker and he worked with um, Fiona Staunton from Brook Lapping or from, from, what are they called now? Um, Zinc. Um, so, so we had Fiona, who's a very seasoned journalist. She looked after... This world for a long time. She worked in news and current affairs at the BBC. She's executing quite a few things for us, and and Loda was just a very passionate man who who stuck with that story and stuck to those people. They got very angry with him afterwards, but um, yeah, they did. Oh. But but you know, I mean, and he made a fantastic film, and and he he had about four hundred hours worth of rushes. Um, and, and we all worked really closely together to boil those down and boil those down. And he was filming right up to the end, right up to the, de the, the date of Brexit that didn't happen. Um, and, and, you know, he made a very different kind of series. We, well, it wasn't meant to be a, a, a two-parter. It was meant to be one film. But because he had so much great stuff, we, we decided to make it into two, which Cassian stripped over two nights. But, but I think access is key to, to, to almost every story that, okay, that we do. Brilliant. Thank you. This lady, we've got time for a couple of questions. Let's go to this lady and then we'll get to this lady. Hi, um, Maya Padgett from First Kitty Films. Um, Lisa, this is really directed at you mostly. We had a, a pitch for a feature doc that went into the Doc Society Fund at um, February, March time this year, and it was a very rushed pitch. We didn't expect to succeed at the first round, and we didn't. But we weren't dejected. We weren't offended. The, the, Thank the, you. <laughs> the, the question really is that um, when you get the no yeah. email, and I've spoken to a couple of other people at, at Docfest as you've been through a similar thing, you're then sort of left in a void. You don't know what you've done wrong, what bit of the mm. pitch was wrong, and so you don't know how to improve it. And then. One of the nice things about Doc Society is that you can come back and, and resubmit your pitch at a later stage, which is great. But if we don't know what we've done wrong, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's just vital for people in our position to get some feedback. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining that that isn't forthcoming because there are thousands of, of pitches, right? But is there any scope for, for that? Uh, you're correct on all fronts. And um, yeah, I mean, we do say that we're not in a position to give feedback because of the volume, um, but um, let's talk about it. We do, we do, you know, reconnect with people, and when we can, we will offer that to people. I mean, we de also find sometimes, what to, you know, to just give it out there unsolicited can actually be quite annoying to people. And you know, I might get a response. It's like, well, I didn't ask you to tell me why you didn't want. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that would being helpful. But yes, we can give that to you. <laughs> No, another meeting, okay. And this lady here. Um, hi, I guess it's a little bit related, but it's about timing. Like when mm -hmm. do you sub like when do you know that you're at the right point to submit to a fund, for example, like Doc Society? Because sometimes you feel you have to be like halfway through the film before you can start submitting. But you're also talking about that you're taking risks. Yeah. So like Ella, for example, came right in the beginning. And um, I had done a couple random acts with her, and she's kind of quite funky young person. It was in the LGBTQ scene. I, I, I 
So she had framed her story in a world that, um, uh, you know, quite exciting, vibrant talent. Um, but we didn't know how far, how many, how you know, how much, how far she could go with that idea. Um, but we took a chance on it, and then um, we hooked her up with Janine Marmont, who also works with Grant G. And Janine said, um, "Thank you for helping Ella get pregnant and <laughs> and expand the story." So it grew. But I think you, you know, you should come when you feel you're ready to come. But you know, when you've, you know, you've got at least the seeds and the characters and the world and something, rather than just a milieu that you want to be floating around in. And, you know, we also, on our applications, have this one-minute um, pitch. Uh, not pitch. It's exactly not a pitch. It's a motivational video. Why you? Why now? And everyone needs to do it. And that really can show a lot about where you are with the project. Can I just say one thing before you yeah, kick me off? Sure. If anyone wants death by panel, I'm on another panel after this. Oh, I'm but, about to announce it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, because of the survey yeah, is really yeah, important. Yeah, okay. yeah. Steve's here as well, isn't he? <laughs> um, I think we've possibly, if, I, if I'm not being too naughty, got time for one last question, if anybody... Okay, this lady here, I'm afraid this first one who had a hand up. Could you make it sort of quite sort of pithy? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, it's Heather uh, on the commissioning index for broadcasts. Um, just a quick question for Mandy about, you mentioned that Storyville do 18 to 20 ish per year. Mm. Um, can I just ask, does that include acquisitions and also what now with the BBC three Storyville, what will be the ratio of things that you're commissioning per year? Okay, um, so it does include acquisitions, but we try not to do many acquisitions because we, we like to be involved editorially in the films and have a relationship with the filmmakers, but sometimes a really brilliant film comes along that Ollie or Anna um, pitch to us and we, we can't resist it. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's just a, a, a film that's too good to pass up. And Minding the Gap. Like Minding the Gap. Mm -hmm. um, and with BBC Three, the plan is, because, because we're starting with acquisitions just because, you know, that was a big thing for them to take Storyville on board, BBC Three, but the idea is to... to have one every month and that we will eventually branch out into co-productions. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, 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 you know, we're starting with three acquisitions, but we, we would like it to be the same as the way Storyville works on BBC Four, where eventually we're doing co-productions and working with filmmakers and, you know, doing a small percentage of acquisitions. So, so it's, it's going to be around 12 a year, give or take, to start with. But, you know, we want, we want that to grow. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're just testing out our relationship with BBC Three at the moment. So watch the space. Great. Brilliant. Um, thank you all very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, the, as Lisa May quite correctly said, at 12 o'clock today, uh, is Steve Presence here? Yeah. Uh, hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Steve will be... Um, sharing a panel at midday. The title is Cinema and State, Developing Policy Frameworks for Feature Docs, which is sort of, in a way, a sister panel to this one, but really expanding out, taking a look at the role of public funding within documentary, of which there's been lots of questions. So I encourage you all to go that. And um, thank you very much for coming this morning. The and, survey. The survey and there's a survey. It's on our website. We need everyone to do the fill out the survey. Check it out. Do the survey. <laughs>